Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and I am welcomed again by Ryan Doris. I know a lot of you guys have wanted him back on the show and found the episode and the chat we had together really kind of insightful and quite different to a lot of the kind of other guests that we've had on the show, which um, I think is really refreshing. So Ryan, how are you doing? First of all, I know you've just completed your season really. It's kind of a few weeks since. Yeah, uh, it's been let's say almost so this coming this coming weekend it'll be about a month since it's been over. Um, and dude, yeah, I just I'm I'm more or less just glad to have my my brain back and my life back and my energy back. That's that's really I'm just in this kind of phase of gratitude just for having that energy and, and feeling good again. So so yeah, man, it's good. It's good. I, it's done. I, completely feel that and i'm sure a lot of the listeners do and i for those of you who don't know ryan maybe you didn't see the first episode i definitely recommend you check that out because we talked about a lot of mindset kind of not hacks but mindset kind of tools to use um for a contest prep and ryan has just completed a pro season um and he competed in the wmbf how did you do yep. share with everyone yep. how you did Ryan? yeah so i competed in the wmbf um and the ipe the former ifpa so um i did two i did one show in each organization um and i did middle of the middle of the pack right i took about middle of my class i placed each time um it's probably the worst i've ever done in bodybuilding right in terms of placing like i've never done poorly um in yeah it was more it was interesting right it was almost like a for me uh it was like a passing down of the, I don't know, I don't know what, what the word would be, like passing of the torch, right? There were these right. young guys, um, dude, man, I was going against these young guys and like, even when I saw them backstage in the pump up room, like they were just like really into it. And I was just like, not, like, <laughs> like I was just like not into it. Like, I'm not trying to say that I was uh, above the experience or better than anybody, um, but the truth is this, man, like I've, I've, I've invested, like you're part of DeNovo, right? I spent years of my life being part of the, being part of getting DeNovo off the ground when, out of, when I was in grad school, like I've done that. Um, I've done well in powerlifting, like I've done well in so many things. Um, I just couldn't be what those people were, right? The people I went up against, dude, they live, breathed and died bodybuilding, they deserve to win. They deserve second. They deserve third. Even if there was some bad judging, right? Whatever. Just based off heart, they deserve to beat me. Um, and I don't think I'm 31 now. I've ever felt this feeling before of like, huh, I didn't deserve to win. Like I've, cause I've never shown up and seen someone hungrier than me. Um, and for the first time in my life, I literally saw people who were hungrier than me. Um, and I think it, didn't so much come down to physiques as much as it came down to like you know being on stage 40 45 minutes those dudes wanted it right and i think it uh kind of reiterates this quote that i've had circulating on the internet for like 10 years <laughs> don't fake passion right <laughs> because like one day you'll meet someone who's truly passionate and you'll just be fucking embarrassed and like i live up to my own quote and i had to humble myself like um i more or less just I really wanted to see if I could still bodybuild again. <laughs> like that's you know that's really what it was like. Um, and dude, like I went in there, I gave him, I gave him my all, and I'm very impressed for the turnaround that I did. Like I'm super impressed that I was even able to more or less not bodybuild for six years. Really, like not do arms for years on it. Just literally, and just come back in and be middle of the pack in some of the top pro shows. So um, yeah, I felt really good, man. I felt really good about uh, how I did. Um, but I just, I, I gotta be honest. I just, I have a, I love bodybuilding, but I have a bad taste in my mouth for competitive bodybuilding, natural bodybuilding in the, in the state that it's in. Um, so yeah, I, I wish I could sit here and tell you how positive of an experience it was, but for me it was, it was more or less very miserable. <laughs> yeah. So that yeah. is sad, but I think it's important and I think so long as you're willing to share that experience, I think yeah. it's really important to share that with the audience because um, I think a lot of us, and I've spoken about this quite a lot because I'm not, I'm never going to have 
the genetics of some of these guys. I don't have the genetics. I hate to pull that card out, but I'm going to, if I ever do very well, it's going to be, they didn't turn up and I did turn up on a outstanding form and that's the way I'm going to have to go about things. And there are Absolutely. people that have to place lower, um, but these people don't be seen on social media. You see the genetic elite, you see the best of the best because these are the people that have the best following. They have the most kind of impressive yeah. physiques. And so you kind of go into these things maybe with some expectations to do really well. So so, so this is the thing that I don't want to get uh, anyone listening confused about. I'm not talking about placing. I'm talking about did you like doing the shit? Yeah. And I didn't like it. You know what I mean? Like I used to prep and I used to actually like it. I used okay. to prep and I actually – I used to get backstage and I actually used to like it. I used to really enjoy it. Like not even talking about placing. Like I literally – I remember, dude, like when we were on stage – there was a moment on my second show when I literally thought to myself, like, what the fuck is taking him so long? Come on, 45 <laughs> minutes? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you, if you go in there with that attitude, you're not going to win, like, at all, right? So it's like I was literally observing my own bad attitude through all of this. And the question was, like, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the world of, like, five guys and you're like, damn, like, I'm not as good as them or I'm not as passionate as them or blah, blah, blah. And it's like I think what I realized out of this prep was, I'm just as passionate or good as I've always been at, at bodybuilding. It's just not in bodybuilding, right? Okay. It's in my company. It's in, you know, my relationships. It's in like, it's, you have, you only have so much, uh, excellence, I think in your tank. And I just really realized that I allocated minimal excellence to, to competitive bodybuilding. And I was up against guys who gave their heart and soul for it. And I'm just not in a position where I can give my heart and so I did I had no heart out there like I did it I technically look good I technically pose I technically did everything but this is still a sport and there's an element of heart to it and I just didn't have it right and so this is not to say that I can never come back and go back and sweep up and do first I probably can but as of as it stands right now like my my heart my passion my energy is in really more or less the community in my in my job around this um and i think if if we all can be objective enough with ourselves we can leave this prison of guilt what that comes around competing right like oh I, I need to prep every two years and i need to feel this and i have to feel this like this this is literally like i'm one of the best natural pros in the world and i'm outright pulling Michael Jordan even said i'm done playing basketball i want to go play baseball and when he came back he came back right so I think this is what a lot of athletes are afraid of, and this is why I'm saying it publicly. I don't want people to think I'm being negative, but dude, when the wave is strong, ride the wave. If it's not there, get the fuck out and do something else. Like, don't waste your time, right? And so I could sit here, come and say the right things, try to be positive, but it was more or less a terrible experience for me. And it wasn't anything on the sport, it wasn't anything on the place, and nothing like that. It just simply came down to, I didn't like it. Like, like Cliff was there with me. Sam Okanola, current world champ, my one of my closest friends was there with me, and he they were the, the way they were talking. I was just like, shut up. Like I just wasn't inter I wasn't yeah. interested in it. Like I wasn't. I just wherever my heart is right now, it's not in competitive bodybuilding, mind you. I go to the gym. Yesterday, I did. Um, you know. I started Olympic lifting. I did two hours of that. And then I went and bodybuild for like two and a half hours. Right. So I'll train five hours. A day. I still love the train. I still love the bodybuild. Like, but competitively, um, I'm, I don't know. My energy just, I, I'm, I, there's some disconnect for me right now. And I'm, and I'm working that out. And, uh, I don't know. I'll be honest about it. I don't know what it is yet that I don't like about it. And I think a lot of it may be, um, just the state of the organizations, mm -hmm. how split they feel, how much rules they are, how expensive it is, um, just how everyone's trying to be like the best, right? Like, well, we, we pose with, come on, dude, there's six guys in the class. Why are you posing us for an hour? Like, come on, like, come on, let's be real. Like, and so there's just a lot of bravado going on between organizations and I, and I, and I wish them in the U in the U S to come together. So yeah, man, I think overall, my current journey mentally in this in this contest recap is like uh, for me and for any athlete that I would that I would give advice to is like start with honesty. Mm -hmm. Start with honesty because generally sometimes it sounds like I'm just complaining and venting, but dude, you can find some real fucking answers in complaints. 
like uh, some real ones, right? Like, so it may sound like I'm just being negative, but I'm not, right? If I'm a human expressing what I dislike, I can say, lay out everything you dislike. Contrar- contrarily to, contra- contrary to that, what do you like then? And that's where my answers will, will come from going into the future. So, um, for me, man, it's going to be at least another six years yeah. <laughs> before, <laughs> before I bodybuilding again. Well, I think, and thank you for clarifying that because I didn't mean to, I, I kind of made it as if you're disappointed with your placing and things like no, that. No, no. And that's not what I... I, de- I deserve my placing. Let that be clear. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, be- I mean, Brian, you brought it and I saw your physique look tremendous and like the, I think natural body building is just getting more competitive full stop it's hard, anyway. Bro. It's hard, yeah. yeah. So um, it doesn't surprise me that, I mean, someone at your standard could place fourth. It's just not a surprising thing now that... There's so many good competitors, especially like is, here man. in the UK. It's getting kind of ridiculous. Some of the competitors out here, I'm just like, how am I ever going to try and stand up above you? I need to compete soon mm-hmm. so that <laughs> the standard's just rising every year. Um, I don't know if it's something you've contemplated, but you talked about, obviously, you haven't competed for a long, long time. Do you think mm-hmm. any of that has to do with how your passion died out for it? Do you feel like you didn't kind of put your, keep getting your feet wet and so yeah. you just got so, out of love with it? So, so I think it's, so I think it's, it's kind of twofold, right? I think one, the reason that I was out of it so long is because after I stopped, like I stopped for a reason, right? Like, so when I, uh, did my last contest in 2012. It was the same show I did the Kansas City show. I won my class. Back then, there were like 13 guys in the class, right? It, like it was just a lot more people in the class. And then I went into the overall with Cleveland Thomas, who's like one of the <clears throat> legendary natural bodybuilders. And I lost by a point, right? At 25 years old, Cleveland Thomas. Like all I used to do was bodybuild. That's all I did leading into that contest since I was 19, just six years of nonstop bodybuilding six years of competing i felt like when i got to that point with cleveland there was something in me that more or less got content i said i'm one point within one of the greats what else can i do take more seconds take more first like come on like it's done so there's something in me innately that just felt finished Mm -hmm. um and i think that's if you look at my track record that is continually my story um my last powerlifting meet was 2016 at the arnold and i lost to ls Two-time world champion. I beat Dave Ricks, a legend. Some something in me said, "We're done. We're done here. Like we're close enough to the top." So I feel a lot of people want to dedicate their lives to get to number one, mm-hmm. but I just want to get close. I, I want to like look and be like, "Okay, I'm close to number one. Maybe with four, four, three, four more years, I can be number one." But as soon as I get to that point, something in me just goes completely in the opposite direction in, in innately. So. Um, I think a matter of interest for me, it's always been that way. I get really good at things and then I'm like, what's the next thing I can get really good at? Two, literally, uh, just from a physique standpoint, in that in that six years that I didn't that I didn't basically bodybuild, those guys did nothing but bodybuild, right? Yeah. They didn't have a catering, they didn't have to cater to a following, they didn't have to manage a company, start a company, they didn't have to start another consulting company, they don't have fifty five clients. They didn't move across the country twice. Like I've done a lot in my portfolio over those years and I'm always at max. I just don't allocate a lot of that energy to bodybuilding. So I showed up and I, there's this guy, um, I forgot his name, but he a shout out to him. We did the WMBS show. He went pro. He did six years upstate, uh, and he's a New Yorker guy. He did six years upstate in some prison in Michigan and he went pro two months when he got out with his ankle bracelet on wow! and then, <laughs> and then he, we did the show together and he beat me by one place. And I looked at him and I was like, you de- yeah, bro, that's all you've done is lifted bo- bodybuilders. Right. And I, in my heart, I honestly have not been bodybuilding purely. So for someone who has ran around and done the mixed bag of things, Fourth place to me is like extremely good. Like that's insane to be middle of the pack, right? And I haven't been a purist. Like I beat people who did nothing but live and die and breathe bodybuilding. And I just kind of like just started thinking about it recently. So um, I'd say for me, it's not about a lack of passion. I think it's where do I feel that I'm, I can express myself best. One, 
I, in, within these organizations, the way the organizations are set up, I don't feel like I express myself best. It feels very rulesy, stop and go, don't do this, do this, pay this, come at this time, come wait. Like, I, so I don't feel like my best in these organizations. Um, compete, competing in competitive bodybuilding, and two, um, dude, I'm just a renaissance man. You know, like the things we've talked about last podcast and this podcast, like I'm just interested in doing other things and reading and moving on. So um, I can't be a purist in anything I think I've realized. And if it takes, you know, five years of purist bodybuilding to be number one, I mean, you can you can count me out more or less because I, I want to do many other things. And I think that that's an absolutely fair enough perspective to have. And it's, it's kind of a refreshing perspective in some ways. And I guess you're probably the first to admit it, that you're fortunate in the fact that you can do that in that you can be very competitive at many different things. And there's probably people that couldn't be anything but purist and be very good at kind of one thing. Um, so absolutely. that's really and I, cool. So I think people it. get cornered. I'm sorry, before we move on, I think people get cornered and I, and I felt that at a young age too, is that I think when you're, when you're young, when you come up the ranks or when you come up, when you're good at anything, the first time you get competent at something, you want to hold on to that because it feels good to be competent. And so you say, well, shit, I'm a really good figure competitor. This is what I identify myself with at being good. Therefore, I must hold on to this. And you almost become a slave to your competence. And it's like, if I would have become a good natural bodybuilder, and don't get me wrong, nothing, there's nothing wrong with Philip Ricardo. Philip Ricardo was like junior. He was legendary bodybuilder, still is, is like, was like my idol coming up. If I wanted to chase, chase what Rico was doing, I could have done that. I could have simply said, I just want to keep doing this because I'm good at this. Let me stop here. I'll be safe. I never have to be bad at anything again. And I think that is why I'm speaking about this so openly is because I've taken the risk. I've been really, really good at something. I've been on the mountaintop and then I'm like more or less like, okay, cool. Where's the next valley to start over? Like I constantly start over. So I don't know if you've seen on my Instagram, I, like I said, I just started weightlifting literally. Like, mm -hmm. um, so I've been weightlifting twice a week now and people are like, geez, like keep going, like do, do the Yorton, do the this, do the blah. And I'm just like, no, I just want to weightlift. And here's the thing, dude, give me four years or so. I'm not calling it, but I'm going to be really good at weightlifting. Right. And then people are going to tell me what to do with my competence. So I'm not some rebel or anything like that, but I think for anyone, if you get, if you can be good at one thing, you can be good at many other interests. And I just fear that so many people say, well, I have good Wilkes and I have to be a powerlifter here that they get stuck into almost being a slave to what they're good at because they're afraid to veer from that. So I just not me, not me, right? I've never cared what people said. I never cared about placing. I just care about my own interests, my own hobbies. Um, and, and I think that's what has made me ha genuinely happy over time. It's not feeling like I have to do anything because I'm good at it. And I think that's a really good uh, kind of mindset to have. I think a lot of people do feel that way. They're cornered into something because they think they should be doing it rather than they actually want to be doing it. Yep. And um, I think a good example of this, a lot of the listeners will know, like Bryce Lewis, he did bodybuilding and now he's like one of the best powerlifters in the world. Yep. And he could have pursued bodybuilding and probably done pretty well in that, but he's probably a better powerlifter. And some people don't realize how good they can be at something because they never give it a chance. They never give it a shot. And then I think the thing is like, sometimes you don't realize how happy something will make you, right? It's not even about sometimes being good. Like I've been good at a lot of things, but like, it doesn't make me any happier. It almost, it's like you go and you win a title and you're just like, yes. And it's like, I did a good job, but did you enjoy that process at all? And sometimes the answer is more or less, no, I hated it. I was just focusing on being good and competent. And I, and I have to ask myself, like, what do I value as an athlete? As an athlete, I value feeling good, not being injured. I value being happy with my athleticism. If I'm ever at a point where I'm using my athleticism to not be happy to be honed in on some reward, some some fucking trophies by some dude I never met who's been eating Twinkies for the past two years and gonna put this medal on my neck. Like, like you have no idea. You can't even do what I do, right? Like, and how are you telling me I'm the champion of it? Like, you you've never been close to being as good as me. So, for me, it's all about the internal with your athleticism, man. Like, be honest with yourself. And dude, you'll feel like you're letting people down. Like. Dude, don't get me like the next day, like after Kansas City, I knew I knew it right away. I was like, I just got up 
I was in a room, uh, like my brother was there, like my girlfriend was there, I just got up at like 5 a.m. and I just opened like a Google Doc and a word processor and I just wrote. I just wrote from like 5 a.m. to like 8.30 a.m. I just wrote everything I felt and I just dumped, right? And I think one of the biggest chapters more or less in this writing was uh, I felt like I was letting people down. I felt like I was letting Cliff down. I felt like I was letting all these people who were excited for the Natty Repro Re, Natty Pro return down. And like, you know, like one of your best friends from college has a pro world title, you know, Sam. And Sam's like, okay, you got to get yours now too. And then like, even like, yeah. And like, and like a lot of my friends have one world and stuff like that. And like, and there's a, there's a pressure to it, but I have to really ask myself like, what's that value, right? Am I doing this to impress them? Or are you trying to be happy? Like my number one value is I just want a good life and I just want to be happy with my athleticism. So I think once you have a Northern star, once you know your great reference, um, you can say these things and be clear and not be afraid, right? A lot of people may hear this and think like, oh, like quitter. Dude, fuck, I just had, I like, I've had the best year financially I've ever in my life. It's off the fucking wall. Like, like. I'm having the happiest year of my life. You know what I mean? So it's like a few handful of people may feel some certain way about me bodybuilding, but it's like I need to make this decision to go into the right places for other facets of my life. And um, yeah, dude, I feel like as hard as it is to, to say these things and to make these decisions, dude, it's that – it's that uh, that honesty will will, will will plant will water those seeds of growth, but it starts with being honest in your discontent and what you do like or don't like. So, yeah, and I think especially to be like you said, you could almost envision yourself being the best if you invested that much, but you're not willing to almost. And we talk about like sacrifice to win sort of things, but it is in a sense you would probably have to sacrifice relationships, business. To just absolutely plunge everything into this one goal um which for you you've kind of done a cost benefit analysis which everyone should probably do and then weigh up whether it is worth it and it's like and that's a question i always ask myself questions it's like the best for fucking who 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 like the best for who like some literally i want to be the best and you're going to put all of your valid like i just i just personally i don't want to i love the wmbf right I don't want to spend the next five years of my life waiting for positive reinforcement from the WMBF to give it to me, to tell me I'm the mm-hmm. best. Dude, I'm I'm the fucking best. You know, told me that me, all right? Like I like I'm self-loving. I'm self-validated. Like, dude, my physique was fucking bonkers, right? Like those dudes' physiques were fucking bonkers. I was like fourth place by like percentages. There were no blowouts, right? There was no like like this is the pro ranks we're talking about here. So for me, that's like, dude, how do you feel about yourself? And I think people, in in, in especially in, in in physique sport, you wait too much on this validation from some fucking stranger, yeah. like literally a volunteer who's judging for free, right? They're not a professional. They're not getting paid for the like. It's just like, who are these fucking like knuckleheads? You're waiting on your positive reinforcement for. So I think if people just kind of like realize the illusion of it all, like you're in a fucking high school, like you're in a high school flexing, like you're not in some like mad state, like, and when you really see the big picture, you really start finding the values that you have on yourself. And I think I have found all of those. And, um, psychologically, those values just don't come at battling fine gentlemen on stage for, you know, a thousand dollars. So yeah, if you, if you can do that for the love, man, kudos to you. That's why I'm calling myself out and being like, no, nah, call me a sellout, call me whatever you want, but I don't got enough love for that, right? I need to produce fire content. I need to do podcasts. I need to put out education. Like yeah. those things make my buttons click. Like you may be able to beat me on stage, but you can't beat me at this. Like this is where I want to be good at and I don't need someone to tell me I'm good at it. So um, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's really my takeaway. Like I said, when I got on, I'm glad I have my brain back above, yeah. <laughs> above all. I mean, we've all, well, any of your competitors have been there where, yeah, you get into what Eric Helms calls zombie mode and you yep. can't do anything but what you're trying to do. And once you're out, <laughs> you're out. Um, but I like that is a, a great comment because I think a lot of people, especially maybe first time competitors or people who think they want to get into the sport, they kind of yep. view um, kind of people competing. They don't realize like 
it depends who turns up on the day. It depends on what the judges want to see that like year yep. even. There's so many different things that are happening that you don't even realize. And it's only when you get maybe you get the, the pros, they're of a standard. You get to finals, they're of right. a standard. But if you're different. talking individual shows, then you almost, if you win, it could be that you're the only person that turned up. But you're Absolutely. the only person that knows that. And if you think that gives you validation, it doesn't. You do have done better yeah. to have a, a whole load of people competing against or whatever so you have to do it for yourself i think that that was the overall message it's just like totally people who try and train for getting a six-pack and they're like when i get a six-pack i'll be happy and then they realize i've got the six-pack and i've like left all my family behind and i've not enjoyed my life for the last the, year <laughs> it, dude and the key thing to remember is that you need to do this all for yourself in a competition is simply the organization of comparing yourself on to people who do the same thing as you. A competition is simply a bunch of people who are doing this to try to see what their best self is. And then it's like, okay, I, the WMBF, will organize the best self contest. Yeah. That's all it is. That's all, like, you have to remember that it's always about you in this sport. Like, how good can I get? How balanced can I be? Like, don't look at other people. It's just simply a pageant. It's literally a pageant. It's like, Keep the main thing the main thing. My love, dude, my love is fully in training. My love is fully in bicep curls and movements and, you know, my and cardio. Like, dude, that's where my heart and soul is. But uh, keep keep it there. Keep the energy there. Keep the energy and dieting and training. And how lean can you get? In? Like, that's that's where it's at. That's where the sword is alive for me. That, I mm -hmm. love that part. The competing part don't let them knock you off off your shine like because you you it's just you versus other people who are trying to see how good am i and that's really all it is no i love that perspective and we've kind of um talked about it a little bit and the thing i was really gonna get you to talk about was um where did i had a i wrote a note and it was the cost of specificity was my kind of oh, phrasing yeah. and it's this is uh, one of your Instagram posts kind of inspired this for me where you were talking about kind of you're going into weightlifting and then you want to get into powerlifting again and you're going to keep bodybuilding on the side and how everyone gets well and, and rightly so sometimes people get very specific with their goals because they want to put everything into it but you kind of argued yeah. how you don't want to kind of the cost of specificity for you was too high it's too high for me yeah um and I think and I think one, let me be clear, I say that because there's no money involved and like my, and I'm saying this from a, a comparative example, my, my, I have a younger brother who's a triple jumper. He's an Olympian. He goes to all the world championships and things like that. Excuse me. For him, being specific has a great return, right? If he just triple jumps, he will make a six figure career if he just triple jumps. Now, I'm not saying that money is like the most important factor, but there is like you have to survive, right? You, you Like it's very hard to be – you can be happy homeless. I'm not saying you can't be, but you can be. But for me, within what I love to do, I love to strain train. I love to bodybuild. I love to get lean. I love to bolt. Like I like to do all those things. To be as hyper-specific as you need to be to become a Brian Whitaker – for me, this is a personality thing. This is for my own personality. It is not even close to being worth it, like in any degree, right? Because I will sacrifice family time, relationship time, uh, work time. I will take away from other passions. And this passion more or less becomes your obsession. It's all you do. It's all you think about. You live night and day around this thing. And then you start, and I personally start thinking like, what is the return of this? The return is one financially not that great um and i say this because i'm in a current phase of my life where wanting to get engaged is important wanting to buy a house is important right like those are other current conflicting goals i would have never said this seven years ago six years ago because it wasn't a goal i was just in grad school i can put my heart on the line right so maybe let's say i get over this hump i get settled again Maybe I can go back to saying the returns are worth it, I, I'm, the things I'm sacrificing again. So um, as it stands right now for me, being hyper specific is just not worth it because I'm healthy. Um, I the, the what was the word I want to use? The measure of utility that I get out of being able to uh, is if, if you put happiness as a unit, if I get three units from Olympic lifting, if I get 
um, five units from powerlifting twice a week, Olympic lifting twice a week, bodybuilding four times a week. Like I'm balancing out the units of happiness. Let's say I cancel out all those other units of happiness from all those other things and then I'm purely bodybuilding. Well, now I'm hitting diminished and marginal returns on the points, happiness points that I'm getting, right? So everything up to some degree gives you happiness points. So maybe um, being able to watch Netflix, you know, every night for half hour, maybe that gives you five points, right? So I'm trying to objectively think about what makes me happiest. And obviously, if I did nothing but watch Netflix, it would go from five points to around negative 20, right? That's bodybuilding to me. Mm -hmm. It goes from a point where if you do enough of it, Maybe you can get seven or ten points of happiness, but when you get into that last six weeks and it's all you do, you actually hate it, right? It's no longer even a positive point, right? It's 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 a negative. So my thing is basically like this: how close can I be to something that it maximizes its happiness points, but how can I get to right to where it's like perfectly on point for me? Because when I over-identify with anything, I don't like it. It's like you can spend too much time. With somebody you can do too many podcasts you can feel overworked too much of anything is a bad thing and to inherit bodybuilding to be good at it you inherently have to do too much too much is is the standard more or less so um for me it's more about I, a life perspective i try to talk to people who want to be happy because dude like when you're on top of the world in like top of bodybuilding you're on top of the stage the top power lifters dude i look back and i'm like there are literally hundreds of thousands and millions of people who are not at this level, this elite level. So for the masses, what is the answer, right? As an elite a competitor, I'm yelling down to the masses like, don't fucking come up here. It <laughs> sucks. Like, be happy. Like, be happy, right? And like, you may think wanting to be a number one is all you do. But like, dude, I have direct relationships with Bryce's. I know Bryce. I look at Bryce, I'm like, what's up, man? He's like... I'm feeling burnt, dude. I talked to Birdo. Birdo's like, yeah, man, I don't know. Brian Miner, dude, I do. I know all these guys who are at the top and I hear the truth and it's like, we're fucking tired, right? It seems more glamorous than it actually is. And um, I don't know, maybe I just feel like I have nothing to lose. Maybe it's the way I've set up my business so that I can be honest and not have to keep up a certain brand. But um, for me, being so specific, you have to ask yourself, who am I doing this for? And am I so specific Am I actually getting negative points of enjoyment? And so whatever that balance is and mixing specificities and integrating those things, that's what I feel is most important. Because at the end of the day, you'll be forgotten in 100 years, I think it is, you know, so. And I guess I, I really like the, the point system you did for that because I was going to think like, how can you objectify something? How can you know if what you're doing is worth it? And I think actually using such a point system is, is a good way to think about it. Yeah. And, and I guess the risk of obviously having not having the ultra specificity or not a great deal of it is spreading yourself too thinly so you're not really progressing in any one direction. How, how do you go about making sure that doesn't happen? You always progress. You just progress slow, right? There's no such thing as not progressing. You just have to know that it's not going to come as fast as you want. Um, mind you, right? Like, like I said, man, there are two. Tra I have two training days out of the week where I train six hours. Like I'm not, like I'm not some slacker here. Like I'm not the Natty Pro on accident. Like I, st I still go hard as I can. Like there are some days where I, where I have to do that. But like, um, I think that's the thing is that you have to let go of the of the of the. Uh, it's all all of those things are just a result of it. So whatever the like whatever the result of it is, let it go. Right. So I, I want to train, get better at my training. I want to be in the gym. I want to feel free. I want to learn. I want to be more comfortable with the bar. I want to be in it. Like a derivative of that is like followers. A derivative of that is education. A, a side effect of that is my play. That's, those are all side effects. I could give a fuck about any of the side effects. Like I want the thing, right? The, to me, like the thing that matters is like, can I grab this bar and can I just be, can I just in this moment have some flow, feel lost, get some happy points. Now, if I progress or I don't, I don't give a shit. Like I just want to, I just want the bar, right? Right. Like if, would you still, and I've, I've heard this question at BS all the time, like, would you still train if you knew that you would make no more results? You would always be the same. 
more for most people, the question is, yeah, I just like how it feels, right? So the thing is, like, I like how it feels to try harder. I like how it feels to be in the moment. On accident, I, I progress almost seemingly, right? And obviously you have measures of programming and tracking volume and stuff like that that you do, you do want to progress. But I feel like if you keep the main thing, the main thing, keep the love in your training and your diet and seeing, getting into different recipes and like keep the love pure, dude, you'll, you'll be first. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll rank up, like you'll, you'll, you'll be perfectly fine. So, um, that's how I more or less feel about it, man. I don't worry about the result. I worry about the thing and I really put my energy into that and doing that has gotten me to this point. Cool. So. No, that's absolutely fair enough. And I think that's, it's a nice new perspective that I think a lot of the listeners will kind of enjoy because I don't think what you're talking about is kind of not being specific by any means. It's just kind of directing it in a certain way. And it's just kind of like a softened specificity and you're being specific enough to still see progress. It's not so far as, right, I still want to do bodybuilding. I'm just going to not do bodybuilding anymore. It's like you're still keeping and, it there. And it's done in the name of who do you want to give the power to. So if you want to go and give the power to your powerlifting federation and they tell you how fast you need to progress, where your place needs to be, then if you give them all the power of yourself, then go and chase that carrot. But I, the power is in me, bro. It's mine. Like It's simply I'm not giving up my power to anyone. And it sounds like a very mature divorced woman thing to say like i'm never giving up my power but it's the truth like i have the power of this i dictate where it goes and how it goes and so um i think that's the biggest takeaway right so it's like if you want to i had a conversation actually with meg squats i was with i was with her last week we did this little thing and um it was a private conversation so i don't want to put it out there but she basically more or less we were on the same page she was like she was like i asked myself with ron asked she's like like what am i doing here she was like, my influence is like, it's not on the platform. She was like, I, I got away from work. I got away from these things. And I feel like a lot of people who are purest competitors um, won't understand it. But it's like at the same time, it's like you get to be a purist because there's someone keeping your industry alive, right? It's us with the tens of thousands of followers who are spreading what you do, right? So it's like there's a balance to it all. So um, I think it's just knowing where you want your power to be, your worth to be. If it's if you're okay giving it to the IPF, do it. If you're okay giving it to the Federation and you want to chase their standard, do it. But count me out. Um, I just want to do my own thing. And chances are if you do your own thing and you do it to the max, you'll probably still be pretty good in the, in the Federation, right? So This is reminding me, and I don't know who um... – You'll know who he is, but I don't know what your relationship with him, with him is. And I'm sure the listeners will know Matt Ogus as an example of okay. someone who kind of a lot of what we're talking about kind of reminds me of how he could have probably been a very good bodybuilder, but he's chosen a different path. He doesn't compete anymore. He still has a fantastic physique and he still loves what he's doing, but he's kind of got Absolutely. almost like a bigger calling like you're talking about, like he's helping a lot more people, providing yep. more content, that yep. sort of thing. And that, and dude, and that's, and that, and I'm good friends with Matt, right? So I, I will reference to Matt. Like, I remember when Matt kind of first spoke to me about it. He was like, yeah, I just think, uh, I'm just like exhausted more or less. Right. And I think when you're capable of, when you're, when you know in your heart, you're capable of being an airline pilot, but you're the trash collector, it's frustrating, right? You, it's, it's, it's not that you, you feel like you're better than this, but you're not expressing yourself, your gift at the highest level. And so I think that's a frustration a lot of people who are multi-talented. We see it under musicians, right? It's like, oh, I love this album. Then the next album comes out and it's like, why did they change? What? Because, dude, like they want to express in a different way. Like that's what people do. They just want to change things. So if you're a super A-type, regular, conservative person who wants to do the same thing, yes, go full on charge. But if there's anything in your heart that's like, try this. Man, I run as fast as I can towards that direction and try it, you know, so. And when we're talking about this, again, it makes me think of like career path. So many people like get into, like they start at the bottom rank, they're like an admin assistant on some sort of whatever it might be. And they just go up the ranks. They just follow that path and that's just what they do. Whereas mm. a lot of people might want to go and become self-employed, follow a different passion. And that's a financial thing, like you can't screw around with that. That might be too high of a risk. But what we're talking about is just what you do with your body and what you do with your fitness. So that's really cool, I think. Yeah. And it's and, and the thing to keep remember, 
everything's finite, right? You can't fuck around with this thing forever. It will break down, it will rust out or wear out eventually, right? So whatever your age is, know that you will have your peak for only so many, you will be you will be climbing to climax for 10 more years, five more years, two more years, or you've already hit your climax and you just better enjoy what you got left of it. Mm-hmm. So that's the way I look at it. I think people get, like again, you, you're going to give up your entire youth of athleticism to something that you kind of like. Make sure you really like it before you give your power to something. So um, that kind of puts the cap on uh, where I'm at with competitive bodybuilding. I, I love bodybuilding, but the comp- competition itself, I do not have the gas for it <laughs> right now. So that's. I think, yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear what people think to that in the comments below. If people want to comment to it, if it's made you think of anything, I'd love to hear. Um, the only other thing I wanted to talk to you today about Ryan is, um, and I think you might be a good person to talk about this too, uh, is imposter syndrome uh, in terms of a variety of aspects in terms of kind of, yeah, I mean, being a natural pro bodybuilder, being kind of someone, an influencer and these sort of things and providing content and information and how you've dealt with it personally or have you dealt with it personally or has it never been a thing for you? Like, have I dealt with being an imposter myself or feeling fake myself? Feeling like there are people providing it or doing it maybe in a better way than you or feeling like you have nothing more to add. Have you ever felt that way? Or have you always felt like Ryan has something to say that was worth other people hearing? Because I think there's people who Uh, potentially have stuff to say, but they're kind of like, ah, there's no point in saying it. So I have a uh, man. I have this. I have like this personal constitution of like things that are like I have to remind myself on that I do a bad job, and it's fluid, like a constitution should be, like always changing. But whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's just a frustrated American here. But uh, <laughs> one of one of the things I have is uh, ride ride your wave. Like I, that's one of my rules is ride your wave, and another rule I have is uh, the people, not the celebs. So it's like. Um, right now on Instagram, you and I have, I think we're similar in the ballpark of the 30,000 followers type range. I have, I have a little less than you or something, I think, but who the fuck are you to have that many people? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think the, I think it boils down to this is that you will speak to your people. So it's like my friend, uh, I'll use an example, Jorge Rosado, fitness IQ, right? He has, I don't know, like, like a ridiculous amount yeah. of followers, like 350 or something like that thousand. Jorge, since the day I've known him, has always done more basic bitch stuff than I, right? He's always, he's he's just always been that way. I love him for it though, right? He's always like, he's always been like that. So his people are more general, more towards the mean, more towards the average. So when he speaks, he speaks towards his people, his 350. When I speak, I speak to my people, right? There are... There's nothing new under the sun, right? It's like music. It's like, dude, it's like a scale. It's like a scale has like what in music, like eight notes or something like that. Some scales have 12 notes. Dude, how many different songs and types of music, the same drums, the same notes over and over. Speak to your people. Speak to your style. Like your people are waiting for you. If you don't say something and you have like 12 kids out there or 12 people out there who are just like you but they don't have an opinion leader you're doing them a disservice i don't speak to meg's audience or jorge's on dude i got a bunch of ryan dorses the people who fuck with me and i speak to them i i'm not talking to you so the way i look at the internet i try to i try to make everything tangible when i put up a youtube video or I put up a post Think of going out into public in a mall or something and think of if you're having a conversation with four of your friends and you're at dinner and you're just talking to four friends and you're just going on a story and then like five people jump in. They're like, oh, shut up. This is stupid. You would be like, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking to you, right? The internet just has cross traffic, yeah. right? It doesn't have like you have to just speak out loud and your, and, and, and your words will fall upon your people's ears, whether that's one, two, three, or 5,000, whatever the number is. So I keep that in mind, the people, not the celebs. So it's like, I can look at somebody with a million followers or something and I'm like, damn, Julian Smith is killing it. What do I got to say? You know, but like I am speaking right now to, to whoever's listening to this. There's probably someone listening to this. Like I fucking feel that dude. I've never heard him say that. It could be one person. 
It could be a thousand people. So my thing is speak to your family. That's what the internet is for, is to find me and Steve Hall, dude. Like, dude, we're me and you are like. If people ask about you, I'm like, oh, that's my bro. Man. He's like, we click. Yeah. We are across the fucking world. Right? Like, you know what I mean? And it's like, we, because you've been loud enough and because I've been loud enough, it's like fucking whales, dude. Like, the echo location. <laughs> right? Like, we have found one another. So if you feel that you have nothing to say, yes, you're right. You have nothing to say to people who aren't your people. But speak to your family. Speak to make those connections. And it's like kind of like those Freud elements. It's like the need to feel wanted is important so mm-hmm. for me i post and i think about it more as a catharsis i say here's what i feel is anybody in agreement with me i'm not trying to sell anybody i'm not trying to get money from anybody i'm simply saying how i feel so there will be like i said some people who hear this podcast and think fuck that dude there are some people who'd be like oh my god like i felt that but i just didn't know how to say it yep. right so i just go out on a limb go out on a limb speak to your people and you know who won't like it? People who aren't your people. So yeah. fuck them anyways. I wasn't talking to you. You know what I mean? So um, that's how I feel, man. Everyone needs to connect. with There's somebody for everyone. And you are that person, that tribe, that group, somebody. Speak to your people. And the rest is just some dude coming up to your table at dinner who does it, you don't even know. So I think that's yeah. a brilliant answer. It's the only way I've ever been able to develop my audience is being like you just be true to yourself you just talk how you want to talk and you just say it rather than there's no imposter you can't feel like an imposter if you just speak to you you speak to you and connect to your own so yeah it makes me laugh because um i've been doing it well trying to get into the industry somehow for years like i had social media and i can remember i think i've even got the youtube videos back if people wanted to look of like awful videos of me doing things that I was like doing what the Hodge twins were doing. I was like impersonating yep. them. Matt Ogus, right, so I was trying to be like him. Um, nothing works. Like it's obvious when you don't, when you're not yourself and it takes practice though. It, and I'll, I'll actually, I'll tell, I'll tell everybody kind of how I got my break really, really fast. I know time wise. So here's the way I started was I started, like I said, as a purist athlete, I was bodybuilding. Um, this was like 2009, 2010. I was doing well in natural bodybuilding. Um, and then at the sponsor I had at the time was Salvation. Salvation is still doing very well. And I remember Mark Lobliner, who was a CEO at the time, he sent us this email and he was like, we have to, like the forums used to be the thing, right? And he basically said like, we have to do more than forums. And he's like, you have to put out this or this or do demos and blah, blah, blah. And you had options. So I said, okay, I'll do like a demo a month, two demos a month, whatever. And it was good. We got paid. And then you had to put out some type of written content. And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Like I'm in school, you know, I was an undergrad and I was like, I'm just going to put out a video. And that's how the OG Natty Pro vlog started. And so I basically just put up a camera once a week, twice a week, whenever. And I just said how I felt, talked about prep, talked about where I was in it. And I did that enough. I did that enough. And then eventually at some point, Elaine Norton saw it. And he posted a video that really resonated with him. And through me being honest, it hit an honest part with him. And it hit an honest part in his already built demo, right? And then Lane, same way. He got his kind of rise through like Dr. Joe. Dude, it's all about being honest. And if you be honest every day, over 365 days, you'll post one piece of content that really resonates with an influencer of your people. And that's how the wave gets up. And that's how you blow up. Like for people who really want to make it in this industry, that's all it is. Be honest, find your influencers, right? All these people I've named, Meg Squats and Jorge, like these people have huge followings, but they are also my friends. Yeah. They just so happen to be my people with followings. And that's all it really is in fitness. Instead of trying to find your way in, start out honest and you will be found. If you make good music, we will find you. If you Einstein, we will find you. Like, cause we want to find, to find one another. So, um, if you're super negative and you have nothing, nothing positive to say, there's a demo for that. <laughs> we got <laughs> vegan gains. You know what I mean? There's a demo for that. <laughs> No matter who you are, there's a demographic. So just be you, even if it doesn't come out feeling the best. So that's how I deal with it, man. And hopefully that that helps too. No, I think people I to break through. You've given some really good, like overall messages from this podcast is like be you and do you almost. It's like just 
don't do what other people think don't do what you think you should do or what other people think you should do just do what you kind of want to do and you that's have the way to, to live life <laughs> yeah. you have to because you're going to waste your life you don't come yeah. back no matter no matter what happens from a theist perspective you go to heaven hell, nothing it doesn't matter what happens this ain't happening again bro like don't waste your life waiting for a first call out you're you're wasting your life like you're wasting it like live live how you want to live and, and live on your means Call your own shots, have autonomy, feel competent, feel good about what you're doing. Um, even if it starts with being one of the best pros in the world and it's just outright coming out and saying like, yeah, it was a miserable experience for me. Right? People won't want to hear that, but it's the truth. And I'm sure I'll be the first to say it and we'll start hearing more of it from my saying it. It's, it's, it's very easy to be you, but it's very hard to waste a life doing what other people want you to do and these people don't know shit. So. Brilliant, Ryan. And I think we we'll probably call it there. I think that was yeah. really nice p- perspectives. Again, it's always refreshing to talk to someone who is completely honest about these things. Um, and I think it becomes very true and obvious that you are. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time. And if people want to find you, obviously YouTube, Instagram, these are probably your biggest kind of outlets. Yeah, just all the social media outlets. Yep. And then those all take you if you want to contact me to my site and just the Natty Pro is all of my tags and all that. So um, yeah, even if it's not even about coaching or anything, just a life intertwined fitness related question. I feel that is my number one request <laughs> that I get. So, so yeah, contact me if, uh, if you and no need to rush, even if you hear this and you don't know what to say for a year, contact me. I'm a regular person. I don't have an assistant doing my socials or anything like that. So you might in that time. <laughs> That's a lie. I don't think I ever will do. <laughs> yeah. So guys, thank you for listening. I'll make sure that's all linked below so you can get in contact with Ryan um, and we will talk to you soon. Cheers.